Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We praise Him and we seek His help. And we seek refuge in Allah from the evil of our souls and the consequences of our actions. Whomever Allah guides, none can misguide. And whoever is misguided cannot be guided except by Him. I bear witness and I testify that there is no deity worthy of worship other than Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. And I bear witness and I testify that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is his final Prophet and his most perfect worshipper. As to what follows, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has reminded us in the Quran to be conscious of him when he says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu attaqullaha haqqa tuqatih wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Dear Muslims, in the sixth year of the Hijrah, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and a group of Sahaba decided to undertake a standard routine journey. A journey that thousands, tens of thousands of people had undertaken. A journey that according to the laws of that time were sacred, sanctified. And this was a journey to perform the Umrah during the sacred months, the Ashur al Hurum. And according to pre-Islamic law, according to the law of Jahiliyyah, that had been in effect for a thousand years plus. No one could be denied access to Mecca when they're coming unarmed during the sacred months. In the entire history of the Quraysh, even if they were at war with other tribes, during the sacred months, the Ashhur al Hurum, all war stopped and there was peace in order to perform the rituals. And the Quraysh had never once stopped any person, foe or friend, enemy or ally from coming and doing Umrah during the sacred months. They understood that this house is the house of Allah and they understood it is not their right to prevent anybody from coming. But in the sixth year, the Quraysh went against their own rule as we're all aware. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Muslims made their way unarmed, wearing ihram, and they came to perform Umrah, the Quraysh refused them access and entry. They went against the law of the land. And for the first time, and frankly the only time in all of pre-Islamic history, they decided to prevent innocent people from praying in the Haram. Simply because of an animosity and a hatred they had for Islam and the Muslims. And they forced a treaty to be enacted, known as the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah. And in this treaty, any fair observer would feel the Muslims got the shorter end of the stick. The Muslims were treated unjustly. Any fair and neutral person would feel that's not fair. You're being unjust towards the Muslims. But the Prophet ﷺ agreed to any condition that would prevent bloodshed and would allow them to remain and return back the next year. And one of the most unfair conditions was any person from Mecca who goes to Medina accepting Islam, you will return him back to us. We will torture him. That's our responsibility. And anyone who comes from Medina to Mecca, we will not return back to you. The Muslims said, that's not fair. But the negotiator said, this is a necessary condition. And as they were debating this condition back and forth, one particular Sahabi by the name of Abu Jandal, who was being tortured currently in Mecca. He was under lock and chain. He was literally trapped and locked in his own house. His own father was the one torturing him. And for months, the bruises on his body, the blood, the iron chains was clear. When he heard the Muslims were outside waiting, negotiating, he somehow got rid of that chain and rushed out thinking that once he got to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, once he got to the Muslims, khalas, he is free. He won't have to go back. But lo and behold, as soon as he got there, that's when this very condition was being negotiated. And lo and behold, Allah's Qadr, who is it that is doing the negotiation? None other than his own father. If this is not Allah's Qadr being manifested, if this is not Allah's Qadr being manifested to show us the reality, to give us so many lessons, to allow us to contemplate 
How can it be out of all the people in Mecca, it is his own father negotiating? But that is the reality. Safwan ibn Umayyah, his father, and Abu Jandal, the Muslim son. Safwan, the Qurashi, torturing Abu Jandal, the Muslim Sahabi who has converted. And Abu Jandal comes and Safwan sees his son in the distance and he turns to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's not a Muslim at this time. And he says, that person, my son, will be the first one this condition will apply to. The Prophet Sallallahu said, we haven't yet agreed. We are still talking. And Safwan said, no, this will be. The Prophet ﷺ said, but we haven't still signed. He said, no, I'm not going to compromise. And he went back and forth four, five, six, seven times. Every time, pleading, trying one's best. In my reading of the seerah, I have never come across any other incident in which our Prophet ﷺ attempted so many times over and over again. Give me this one exception. We'll begin after him. Allow him for me. So many times he tried. But... Allah's qadr it was. Had it been anybody else, most likely he might have, but it's his own son. And he said, no, I will not budge. I will not compromise. Even Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, and he's seeing the blood, he's seeing the chains tortured his body, Abu Jandal's body. And Umar ibn al-Khattab, in front of everybody, he says, Ya Rasulallah, how can we accept this? How can we accept this? Are we not upon the truth and they upon the batil? Are they upon the untruth? How can we accept humiliation in our own religion? And he cannot. His blood is boiling when he sees Abu Jandal's torture marks. And he is saying, we're going to hand them back to the Quraysh. How is this possible? And the Prophet ﷺ had to calm Umar down. Abu Bakr had to calm Umar down. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I am Rasulullah ﷺ. And Allah will not misguide us. Allah will take care of us. In other words, this is a divine plan. I don't know what else to tell you. I have to put my trust in Allah. I don't know. But Allah is telling me to do this. Subhanallah, sisters and brothers. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how traumatic that incident would be? And this isn't between two nations of our times. This is between the Prophet ﷺ himself and Abu Jahl and his camp on the other side. You have in your own midst Rasulullah ﷺ. You see him, you're talking to him. And still, he is saying, I can't do anything now. And he makes dua for Abu Jandal. He makes dua, that's all I can do. Oh Abu Jandal, may Allah make a way out for you. May Allah help you. That's all he can do. He cannot physically, the treaty was signed. Abu Jandal was handed back for the time being. And then of course, history goes on and I've gone over this and others have gone over it. Point being, can you imagine being in that environment, seeing this type of reality, if that is not a test to your Iman at that time? In fact, dare I ask the question, can you imagine being Abu Jandal? Just for a millisecond, put yourself in his shoes. He is literally one hair's width away from being freed. He sees the Muslim, he sees Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And he even the Prophet sallallahu has to turn him away and say, Allah will take care of you. Imagine the test of Iman of Abu Jandal. And I say all of this because wallahi, what we are seeing now, it is but a fraction of those tests. We don't have the Prophet saw someone on one side to literally say, Ya Rasulullah, how can this be happening? We don't have that. We don't have the likes of Abu Bakr and Umar on our side. We have nobody like them. And yet still, these trials and tribulations are painful for, watch, for us to watch. The humiliation, the loss of life, the deafening silence of our rulers and leaders, so much pain for our hearts. And so in today's khutbah, a brief reminder of perhaps some of the wisdoms and benefits because in this battle, in this treaty, on the way back, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed one of the most optimistic verses in the Quran. When the Muslims thought this is nothing but defeat, when Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anh is saying, how can we accept humiliation? This is a loss for us. And on the way back, they couldn't perform Umrah. They went all the way, two, three weeks walking, only to be turned back and they see Makkah. Can you imagine how they felt? And they know they've had to turn back Abu Jandal and all of them. How do you think their emotions were? And at that 
moment of pain, frustration, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed some of the most powerful verses in the Quran. Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. We have given you your biggest victory. This is a victory for the Muslims. And look at the Iman of the Sahaba. Abu Umar ibn Khattab, the same one who one hour ago was saying, how can we accept this? As soon as he heard Allah Azza wa Jal's revelation, we have given you a, mis a, a victory. He asked the Prophet Ya Rasulullah, Allah is revealing this incident as a victory. And the Prophet said, yes, this revelation has come down. It is a victory. Umar ibn Khattab said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. He didn't know how the victory was. He didn't understand how can this be a victory. But the mere consolation from Allah, don't worry, this is a victory. Don't worry, this will turn the tide for you. That consolation changed his entire perspective. That's what you call Iman. Not even being told the explanation of how and why. Simply to know that Allah Azza wa Jal is going to give a victory. That was enough for him to say, Allahu Akbar, this is a victory. And indeed, as Ibn Ishaq and others comment, in the next two years, more Muslims embraced Islam than the entire 20 years before that point in time. In the next two years, the Muslims gained the upper hand politically, economically, socially. Yes, that one incident was a setback. That one incident was painful. But Allah Azza wa Jal works in ways beyond our comprehension. And if we do things right, we put our trust in Allah, then every single incident is always a positive. Every single qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal, we must accept it and move on and know that the positives will outweigh the negatives. And subhanAllah, it was barely two years when they thought they were at the lowest of the low, when the Muslims came back entering Mecca, conquering Mecca with barely any bloodshed. The Quraysh had been decimated. Their power, their infrastructure, two years ago, they felt so powerful. They can block Muslims from coming. And if you read the Siran, we went over it, subhanAllah, within two years, a complete collapse of their infrastructure, their social power, their social capital, their PR, because the Arabs heard, how can the Quraysh be preventing people? It was a very, very negative campaign. And the same people who said, we're not going to return the, uh, your Muslims to us, the same people had to go beg the Prophet ﷺ because of internal issues. Ya Rasulullah, Ya Muhammad, please take these people away from us. Get them off of our hands. They literally had to go and beg them to take them away. My point being, sisters and brothers, no matter what happens, and no matter how painful the tragedy is, and no matter how tragic the images are, our Iman, the Quran, the Seerah, it keeps on reminding us that we must always have the best thoughts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We must always be optimistic. We must always understand that the positives shall outweigh the negatives. What are some of the positives that possibly might come out of this debacle that we are seeing? What are some of the positives of 3,500 people being killed? Astaghfirullah, a million people being removed from their houses. Again, this is not to justify or whatnot, but to see what is the reality? What are some of the positives? Of the positives, brothers and sisters, without a doubt, of the greatest positives, is the recentering and the reframing of the Palestinian cause and of Masjid al-Aqsa in the entire Muslim world and frankly even non-Muslim world. Once again, we are talking about a pain and a tragedy that goes back 75, 80 years, yet unfortunately it had become distant in our mindset. Unfortunately, people have forgotten that reality. Now look, everybody is talking, Muslim and non-Muslim, and for the first time, for the first time, many non-Muslims are seeing beyond the hype. Not all, not even the majority, but still, this is the long-term battle. For the first time, many people are saying, it's not this simplistic, it cannot be. Why are these people so angry? Why are they fighting? And for the first time, they're hearing authentic representation about the realities of 80 years of torture, 80 years of imprisonment, 80 years of humanitarian crisis, 80 years of being treated like a subhuman. Now they're seeing this reality. And even if we don't justify, even if we don't 
have to excuse every tactic. Without a doubt, we can sympathize with the cause. Without a doubt, the cause is one that every decent human being will sympathize with. That is a massive positive. You cannot ignore that positive. Of the positives as well, of what is happening, us here and across the world, the Muslim Ummah, we feel a connection not only with Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, but with our religion. Every one of us, we, we feel a sense of responsibility. We feel a sense of duty and that duty motivates us to be better to be stronger to be more spiritual and this is one of the greatest wisdom sisters and brothers all Muslims through pain through suffering through tragedy Iman is built I repeat through tragedy Iman is built let's be honest here when life is good when the money is flowing when the world is lax what happens to our Iman our prayers go down our spirituality waxes and wanes. Our connection with Allah, with the masjid, becomes lazy. But when tragedy strikes, when there's a national or personal issue that affects us, all of a sudden, our iman is revived. That revival, do not underestimate the power. It is a tidal wave that is coming from the entire ummah. And in fact, the Quran explicitly mentions this as one of the wisdoms of pain and tragedy, one of the wisdoms of calamities. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, when the calamity came down, when they tasted all of this pain and suffering, why didn't they turn back to us? Why didn't they rediscover us? Allah is questioning the, the kuffar, the Quraysh. Why didn't they go back to Allah? Meaning, if we turn back to Allah, that calamity has a wisdom, that tragedy has some benefit. We turn back to Allah so many times in the Quran. We sent upon them ba'sa and darra, calamities and trials, la'allahum yarji'un, so that they can come back to me, so that they can return to me. This type of tragedy, the least it should motivate us to do is to be better Muslims. Every one of us, we have the freedoms to pray, the freedoms to fast, the freedoms to be righteous. Our brothers and sisters are being slaughtered. They don't have those freedoms. How then can we not take advantage of those freedoms? That is a massive positive that comes out. Our iman is stirred up. Our sense of religiosity is awakened. And this is one of the goals of pain and tragedy. Of the wisdoms of pain and tragedy, of the wisdoms of suffering, especially for those that are actually being inflicted upon this, is so that their ranks are raised up and that Allah Azza wa Jal blesses some amongst them. Now we don't look forward to death, this is human nature. We don't desire useless martyrdom. We don't just rush in and die for no reason. But those that have passed away, we console ourselves that Allah Azza wa Jal chose them. You see, there's a difference. When they're alive, we protect them as much as we can. We don't do anything foolish. But once death happens, then Allah says in the Quran, when the battle of Uhud took place, Allah Azza wa Jal says, don't think this is bad. No. Allah wants to test your iman and take shuhada from amongst you. Allah mentions this as one of the wisdoms of the tragedy of Uhud. Uhud was also a setback. Over 70 Muslims were killed. The uncle of the Prophet was mutilated. The Prophet himself was wounded three times. Three times he was wounded. And Allah says, don't think it is evil. No, there's wisdoms. And of the wisdoms, I want to test the people of Iman. I want your Iman to be better, stronger, more perfect. And we see this happening across the Ummah. And especially, especially amongst those people, that generation, that Sha'ab, that entire group of people who have been tortured for 80 years. Look at how strong their Iman is. I swear to you, any other faith community, they would have lost their faith. What type of God is this that is doing this? But look at what is happening to our Palestinian brothers and sisters. Wallahi, the mothers are happy. The fathers are accepting Allah's qadr. A young child, eight-year-old, is giving shahada to his six-year-old brother who's dying. Say after me, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. What iman is this? Where does this iman come from? How can this generation of 80 years torture still have such strong iman that it puts people like us here living in comfort to shame? Where does that courage come from? This is the reality of iman. And Allah says in the Quran, Allah wants to see the iman from 
from the people of Iman. And Allah wants to take shuhada from amongst you. So there's no question that this group of people, they're being refined. They're being raised up. They're being honed. They're being fine-tuned. Their Iman, their courage is being raised higher and higher so that when the time comes, we will need that Iman and we will see that Iman, brothers and sisters. Do not understand. Do not trivialize this point. Allah Azza wa Jal is preparing and Allah is choosing. This is not an excuse for us to do nothing. It's a consolation for what is happening. Also, sisters and brothers, one of the realities we learn from the seerah as well is that no matter what tragedy occurs, no matter how painful it is, we do not understand the wisdom of Allah and we must trust that wisdom. Once again, we go back to the battle of Uhud. Once again, we go back to the battle of Uhud. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, initially there was a winning victory. Initially, the Muslims thought the Quraysh are expelled. Lo and behold, Khalid ibn al-Wadi comes back, surprise attack. 200, 180 Muslims are killed. The Prophet himself has to flee for the Ghar, for the, for, the, uh, for the cave on the top of the mountain. And three wounds come. As you're aware, a javelin and a, uh, and, a, and a sword and an arrow, three different instruments wound the Prophet ﷺ. And as he's wiping the blood from his face, no battle was he wounded worse than the battle of Uhud. And the blood is coming down of his face, his beard is wet. And as he's wiping that blood, he remarks, how can Allah ever forgive these people after what they have done to their Prophet? How can Allah ever forgive these people? Human remark. How can, and we have the same anger, the same emotion. How can this happen? How can this, how can Allah Azza wa ever allow this? How can Allah Azza wa forgive these people? And Allah reveals Surah Ali Imran, very powerful reminder. This reminder was revealed when the Prophet himself was wounded, when he was bleeding. And Allah reminded him, Laysa laka min al amri shay'un. This matter of what happens, you are not in charge of it. Even though you're Rasulullah, even though you're the, be the best human being, the Khatib al Anbiya, you are not in charge of what is happening. You are not in charge of who's guided, who's not guided. You are not in charge of who's going to be forgiven, who's not going to be forgiven. And then Allah Azza wa says, regardless of whether Allah Azza wa punishes or forgives them, فَإِنَّهُمْ ظَالِمُونَ They have done wrong unto you. Meaning, even in the thick of tragedy, our Prophet was taught a lesson from Allah Azza wa a lesson all of us should be aware of. We are not in charge, Allah is in charge. We are not in charge, Allah is in charge. And Allah has a wisdom that He knows. The battle of Uhud once again turned out to be a massive victory. Multiple things happened because of the battle of Uhud that would not have happened otherwise. And it turns out in the long run that this minor setback actually turned out to be a massive victory. Another positive, another pro that comes out of a tragedy is that once again, this reality of Allah Azza wa Jal using mysterious ways beyond our comprehension. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala mentions of the wisdoms of the battle of Uhud and the setback. Allah says so that you may know the hypocrites amongst you. You may know the evil of this group of people. And so when you most need help, when people whom you thought could help you don't help you. When you most need help and the one whom you thought was an ally turns his back on you. That is a lesson you will never forget. And you need to know your friends from your enemies for the real battle ahead. You need to know your friends from your enemies. And Allah tells us in the Quran, one of the biggest wisdoms of the battle of Uhud, so that you can see your real enemies. So I say, and I've said it before, look around and see who is an enemy right now to us from within our own ranks. Who is betraying one of the holiest causes of this ummah? who is turning their backs upon Masjid al-Aqsa. And don't forget, because a time will come when we're going to have to know our friends and our allies. And at that time, when these people who have betrayed the cause come wanting some type of truth, some type of reconciliation, let us learn the lessons from the battle of Uhud. And let us realize, at this point in time, if you turn your back to the Ummah, then when the Ummah becomes Izzah, we don't need you at that point in time. You've shown your true colors. And so, sisters and brothers, remember, we don't know when that time will come, but remember this reality. It is one of the divine wisdoms. Also, of the divine wisdoms, and this is without a doubt for all of us here, of the divine wisdoms is to remind us we have a higher cause, a greater goal. A higher cause and a greater goal. Remember, sisters and brothers, when the battle of Uhud took place, one of the most tragic realities of that battle, a rumor spread that the Prophet himself had passed away. 
Now again, put yourself in their shoes. Can you imagine hearing, that's it, the Prophet is gone. Can you imagine hearing that? You know what happened to that army amongst the Sahaba? Some of them threw their swords away and sat down, said, what's the point? And I think most of us would have done the same thing. Some of them literally said, what's the point? There's no point continuing. Losing the Prophet ﷺ made them so demoralized and others said, no, even if he's gone, we still have to move forward. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, of course it was a rumor, turned out to be not true. Allah then revealed one of the most powerful verses about the reality of failure, once again. The reality of the perception of failure. وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلُ أَفَإِن مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلْ إِنْ قَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ Know that Muhammad ﷺ, and Allah calls him by name in the Quran only four times. This is one of the times Allah calls him by name. Know that Muhammad ﷺ is but a Rasul. Many are the Rasul have gone before him. If he were to die, or when he, is, when he dies, or if he were to be killed, will you turn away and turn your backs to the message? Now this is really powerful. Because what this verse is showing us, there is a purpose and a message there is a cause that is so important. It transcends even the life of the Prophet on this earth. Are you guys following this verse? You understand this verse? Allah is saying, when the Prophet goes, are you going to turn your back? When he dies, is at the end of the story for you? Even the Prophet wasallam, his life and his death, there is a cause that is bigger than that. And that is the cause of Allah, the cause of Islam. And this ayah was needed by the Muslims because when the Prophet died, Abu Bakr had to quote this ayah. He literally quoted this ayah that we have a mission to do. What is that mission? That mission will go on in spite of every tragedy. No matter the losses, no matter how many babies have been killed, no matter how many bombs have been dropped, no matter how depressing the situation, is there anything more depressing than hearing the Prophet has died? Can you imagine anything more depressing? Yet Allah revealed, there is a cause bigger than that. What is that cause? That cause for as long as we live. That cause is the cause of our life. It is the cause of our death. It is the cause to preach and teach the truth. It is the cause to be beacons of morality. It is the cause to show mankind what is the meaning of the kalima la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. What is the meaning of truth? What is the meaning of justice? To be a virtue of ethics, a beacon of light in a world of darkness. That is our cause. Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat lin nas. You are the best ummah. Why? Because you command what is good, you forbid what is evil, and you believe in Allah. Your job is to be witnesses to mankind. Sisters and brothers, do not allow a tragedy to cause you to stop in your tracks. Do not allow a setback to let you lose track of the bigger picture. The bigger picture, we all have a purpose on this earth. We all have a nobility for which why we are here. A cause that transcends any tragedy, even the tragedy of losing the Prophet wasallam. Very painful tragedy, but the mission is is broader than that and that mission is what as long as we live our job is to be witnesses to mankind our job is to embody the prophetic character even if the prophet is now with allah azza wa jal his message remains his legacy remains his teachings remain so my job and your job to carry that legacy to carry those teachings and to pass it down to the next generation my job and your job to embody the prophetic message to embody the da'wah the risala of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and to teach muslim and non-muslim to demonstrate to the rest of mankind Mankind, what it means to be a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sisters and brothers, after the battle of Uhud, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consoled the believers. And Allah azza wa jal says, وَلَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Do not give up. Do not falter. You shall be victorious if only you have iman. When the Muslims felt the lowest of the low, when they fell down, when 75 of them had lost their lives, when they were trying to make sense of things, Allah said, وَلَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ Do not give up. And do not grieve, you shall be victorious if you put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us put our trust in Allah. Let us not falter. Let us not grieve. And let us realize we all have a job to do. We will continue to do that job for as long as we have life in this world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless me and you with and through the Quran. And may He make us of those who His verses they understand and applies halal and haram throughout our lifespan. I ask Allah's forgiveness. He was well asking for his the Ghafoor and the Rahman.
Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah, the one and the unique. He it is whom we worship and it is his aid that we seek. He is the Lord of the oppressed and he hears the prayer of the weak. As to what follows, for the last few days, I've been constantly asking every single one of us to realize the tide is changing. And yesterday a survey was done about different age groups in this country and their perception of that reality of what is going on over there. And as to be expected, those above the age of 50, 60, the elders, their perception was skewed. High percentage of, the, of them sympathize with the apartheid regime, sympathize with the oppressor. But subhanAllah, and I have been saying this for so many weeks and days, and yesterday the poll came out. The millennials, Generation Z, the youngsters, the, the tide is exactly opposite. And over 50% of those below the age of 30, the next generation, their sympathies are not with the oppressor. Their sympathies are not with the apartheid regime. They understand that this is a complex situation in which it's not an equality. It's not one side attacking the other for no reason. No, they understand one side is the oppressed. One side has been subjugated. One side is fighting for its freedom. And even if they do things they should not do, the cause is legitimate the goal is legitimate and human beings Muslims people of faith and taqwa have to support that cause the tide is changing every one of us should get involved in the narrative again this is a reality I said this last week I say it again without a doubt we have a media campaign going on that is extremely vicious we now know for a fact there have been academic articles released that Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and others of these massive corporations are actively targeting targeting accounts that support the Palestinians. They are literally either banning them or using their vicious algorithms, making them unseen. You won't even see a tweet that is pro-Palestinian. A lot of times their own algorithms are trying to change this. This is not a battle where we can just allow this to happen. You cannot remain silent at this stage. You cannot not afford to get involved. So I challenge every one of you wisely to get involved in this campaign. The tide is changing. We cannot be involved over there. Nothing we can do, but we can be involved over here. I said it before, I'll say it again. There are two battles going on. There is a battle of the bodies. May Allah help them, may Allah protect them. We can't do anything. But there's also a battle of the minds. There's a battle of media. There's a battle of perception. And in that battle, battle every one of us can become an effective foot soldier we can get involved and we can help change people's perceptions it might be a long battle we might even lose this particular battle but as long as the war will be won even if a battle is lost that is the goal and sisters and brothers we have no doubt that the war will be won we have no doubt that justice is going to be established this is the promise of Allah and the promise of Allah never falters it's not the first time we lost Palestine it's not the first time last time the Crusaders came and for almost a hundred years three generations Muslims did not pray in Aqsa three generations utmost humility and there were attempts after attempts after attempts but the Ummah did not lose hope the Ummah knew that Allah Azza wa would, would, would return Aqsa to the rightful owners and that is indeed what happened but now we are being tested again. It has not yet been three generations. It has not yet been 90 plus years. Close, but it's not. And not that 90 is a magical number. Maybe this time might be longer. Maybe it will be shorter. But without a doubt, Aqsa and the people of that land will be free because the promise of Allah is true. And Allah Azza wa Jal's promise is always shown and manifest. Allah says in the Quran, it doesn't matter about the haters. This religion and the light of Islam will continue to shine. You cannot extinguish the light of Allah. It's not going to happen. So sisters and brothers, the religion of Islam is safe. But me and you, are we doing our job? Me and you, will we have what we need to say to Allah on the day of judgment? Ya Allah, I tried. Therefore, again, I appeal to you. Number one, educate yourself. Educate. Facts. Know your history. This reality in that region, again, you don't need to be an expert to understand it. I've given lectures. Many people have given lectures. So many material. Tomorrow again, uh, tomorrow evening again, we'll have a mini summary once again about the reality of that land. Number one, know. Educate yourself. And number two, with wisdom, with tact. I'm not asking anybody to do foolish. I'm not asking you to resign from your jobs. I'm not asking you to do something that's going to cause you to be fired. With wisdom and tact, 
amongst people whom you know and trust, try to start changing perceptions. That's all. Just to change their perception. Make them understand this reality. Online as well, Facebook and Twitter in particular, those people in charge, you know they are Zionists. You know this is the reality. Okay, that's their philosophy. We will show the world their hypocrisy. They said they wanted freedom on these social medias. Multiple, uh, uh, multiple reports have shown that they are not wanting freedom. They're not wanting equality. But guess what? If all of us come together, we can beat their algorithm. It's a computer algorithm in the end of the day. The more we share, the more we retweet, the more we spread news that is positive and correct, the less that algorithm is going to take effect. How can we remain silent in this war? Every one of us has to do our bit here. Be active in this regard. And in the process, sisters and brothers, we might not see this battle being won immediately. But like I said, the long-term war, it will be won. And Allah Azza wa Jal will record my name and your name as having contributed, as as having done that we can. I conclude, sisters and brothers, with reminding myself and you of a verse that came down. When the battle of Uhud took place and the Muslims were feeling down, what did Allah say? With this verse I conclude. Allah says, وَتِلْكَ الْأَيَّامُ نُدَاوِلُهَا بَيْنَ النَّاسِ These are the days. We give it in cycles to the people. In other words, it's cyclical. Some days you will have the upper hand, some days you won't have the upper, other, upper hand. This is what Allah said, not to me and you, to the Prophet ﷺ, to Abu Bakr, to Umar. He said to the best generation, you win some, you lose some, but don't worry. In the end, the ultimate victory is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Understand, our ultimate goal is not victory in this world. It is the pleasure of Allah. And these tests, these trials, they allow us to show Allah that we want His pleasure. They allow us to do whatever we can so that in the day of judgment we can say, Oh Allah, I didn't just sit silent. I didn't do anything. I tried. In that trying is our salvation. In that fight that we do, and yes, it is a fight, not a physical one, a mental one, an emotional one, a verbal one. In that fight, this is our struggle. So everybody get involved. Every Everybody do what you can and insha'Allah ta'ala the future shall be ours. That is the promise of Allah. Allahumma inni da'in fa aminu. Allahumma la tad'a fi hadhi al-yawmi dhamban illa ghafarta wa la hamman illa farrajta wa la daynan illa qadayta wa la maridan illa shafayta wa la asiran illa yassarta. Allahumma aghfir lana wa li ikhwanin na lidhi samakuna bil iman wa la taj'a fi qulubina ghillan li ladhina amanu. Rabbana inna ka raufur rahim. Oh Allah, we ask you, ya qawiyo, ya aziz, to help our brothers and sisters in Gaza, oh Allah. Oh Allah, send your rahmah, your sikhi upon them, O oh Allah. O oh Allah, help them with you a powerful help, O oh Allah. O oh Allah, aid them with you a powerful aid, O oh Allah. O oh Allah, send the angels to help them, O oh Allah. O oh Allah, those that wish to destroy innocent lives, those that wish to destroy the innocent, the children, the women, O oh Allah, show, show us the power that you have over them, O oh Allah. O oh Allah, show us you are the Qawi and the Aziz, O oh Allah. O oh Allah, help the weak, O oh Allah. Accept their shuhada, O oh Allah. Feed their hungry, O oh Allah. O oh Allah, give them water, they have no water. Give them food, they have no food. O oh Allah, allow the world to sympathize with them. O oh Allah, allow us to be a mechanism, a catalyst to bring about khair and good, O oh Allah. O oh Allah, we put our trust in you, for you are the qawwi, you are the aziz, and we are the du'afa ilayk. O oh, uh, servants of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has reminded all of us to send our salat and salam upon the one who was chosen to be rahmatil al-alameen. For the, Allah azza wa jal says in the Quran, Inna Allah wa malaikudu yusalluna ala nabi, ya ayu al-ladheena amanu, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa بارك وأنعم على عبدك ورسولك محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين عباد الله إن الله تعالى يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله العظيم يذكركم واشكروه يزد لكم ولذكر الله تعالى أكبر وأقم الصلاة فيا ذلي ويا خجلي إذا ما قال لي ربي أما استحييته تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود إلى رضا 